This ain't no joke, this ain't no game. This that CSZ game. They said pull up, so I came. You better put some respect on their name. Yeah, 55 was goody. Kill the vibe, how could he? Big car don't want a hoodie. Let me break it down for you fully. This ain't your average broadcast. This ain't just no podcast. The mother show spread fake news. We just call them broadcast. West, Joey, Sam, Sean, Dalton. And you know that boy Higgy. He said he don't want no small fries. Tell them they better make them biggie. Yeah, you already know what we be on. We got the crown, we hold the throne. We throw the mails and you take them home. When they ring the bells, you know that it's home. The bar is set, we setting the tone. If we set it, then set it in stone. Now sit in the seat and set up your phone. You in the car, no sports zone. <laughs> set it. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of the Cardinal Sports Zone podcast that we call Game Day Prep. This is our weekly series where we talk to some of our favorite people across ACC country or ACC nation as some people call it. And uh, I'm very happy about today's show because it's one of the people that the, the person I have on today is one of the very first people when I started to reach out to different uh, fan bases. He was one of the very first people and we like clicked automatically um could not be more happy to have him on here but again game day prep we started this about five weeks ago i fe- i did something just in fun with the ucf uh, contributor and i was like wait a minute i did that written though i was like if i could do a a, a weekly podcast with somebody from the other side that I, w- I would listen to that if i were a customer and i I had to bring that to you all. It was just like an epiphany, and I'm sure that other podcasters and sites already did that. But for me, uh, I, I really, really like the idea, and you all have seemed to enjoy it as well. Again, today we will talk to a guy that I clicked with almost instantly uh, when we moved, uh, when we entered into the ACC. He also tried to help me get my Twitter back when the website crashed, but to no avail. But he is one of the creators of the Red White Podcast, and you can catch all of his work at the red white network.com it is my guy evan evan what's up man how are you today i'm doing great i'm still upset that we weren't able to get your twitter handle back i don't know how that didn't work out I, it still bothers me to this day dude i mean i had we me and steve rummage and justin rink they 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 both are neither uh i'm sorry neither of them are are still with the site they have moved on uh to radio and uh uh, Steve move on to radio, uh, ESPN radio, and Justin has moved on to be the editor at another website, but we had worked hard, man. We had 14,700 followers that we had put our blood, sweat, and tears into every single day. Somebody came in, grabbed our Twitter. They crashed our website for a month. We couldn't post anything. Felt very, very helpless, but you know what? I'm still breathing. We're all still, you know, we're, we're all doing fine. So th- there's really no complaints, but yeah, man, I, I'm a guy who I, I'm pretty, what's the word? I'm pretty adamant when it co- when I feel like I'm wrong, I, I'm, I'm the guy that you call, everybody's got that one friend that like, if you don't think that you, like, if you have a bill that's due and you don't think you can talk them down, you're like, Hey, let's call so-and-so he's going to get us a really good deal. That's me. I never take no for an answer. And as far as my life is concerned, my record at dealing with places like that is 472 and one. And Twitter is that one. Uh, I'm, I'm making up the first. Now it's close though. I, I I guarantee you. But Twitter has has given me my one loss, and I don't really appreciate it, even though I still use it a whole lot. Evan, thank you so much for joining me today and talking about this game. Uh, whenever the cards travel to rally for a night game, it is it's always crazy. Uh, the game will be taking place this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Cards are a touchdown underdog. Let's get into it, man. I always, with game day prep, I always ask five fun questions, and then we get down to business in the second half uh, in the last five questions. So my first question is this. You cover a team that also gets shafted as far as coverage in the state due to there being hashtag bigger schools to cover. Uh, with the University of Kentucky just 70 miles away, I feel your pain, brother, but we only have one school to fight off. You guys have multiple uh, to to fight off. How is it to cover NC State? Do you do you ever uh, have you personally ever encountered one of these situations where where they're like, ah, you're the NC State guy, Uh, and like, what what are some of the issues you've you've ran into? 
man, you coming out of the gate firing with your questions. I'll, I'll tell you this much. Like, it's a constant battle that I have and I know our fans have on a constant basis. And I, I, I did this last week with a Miami podcaster. At the end of the pod, I asked him, how was, how was your team covered locally for your sports radio? <laughs> and he was kind of confused that I asked him that question. And he said, it's, it's good. They're, they're supportive of the program, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the usual stuff that you would expect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when I explained to him why I asked that and explained that we have a very contentious relationship with our sports radio, he was just, he was taken aback. He had no idea. And it is the exact same. It hasn't changed. We get shafted for, we're used as clickbait from our media you know, Carolina does something bad and they compare it to us, like just out of nowhere, right? State wins a game. Carolina has a bad week and they say, well, UNC will never be anything more than NC State. And you're like, <laughs> what? Like, why are you taking shots at us out of nowhere? Brother, that and is exactly the, set- the same here. Our, the Louisville Courier Journal will not put the University of Louisville on the front page of the sports section. It's always big blue this and big blue that and – if they get in, tr- they got in trouble a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was a month ago, for their players having gun- guns on campus. And the first thing that their media said, well, at least guns aren't hookers. Like, that happened one time, and that I, you can't right. kill anybody with a hooker, as far as I knew. I mean, maybe, like, if it gets too hot and heavy, <laughs> but still. Uh, <laughs> Like, it's everything that they do, it's compared. I feel you're paying 1 billion percent. Well, the worst part about it is that the two, the main, like, drive time hours, the two guys that are running the, that are running the radio show are freaking NC State alumni. And they oh. just shaft us all the time. <laughs> and, I, and I will say the positive part about it is that the sports radio is so bad here that it was our inspiration to start this podcast six <laughs> years ago, right? This is, and if without that, I probably wouldn't have done it because like, oh, we got some coverage here, but it was just not the conversations that our fans want to have. And it is that relationship hasn't changed. There's a reason they, you know, we're, we're in a county of one and a half million people and they average 75,000 listeners. I mean, it's pathetic. It's, it, it's a, it's a bad relationship and it's a, it's just obnoxious. Bro. And I just tweeted something out. I don't know if you saw the clip of the LSU guys, the LSU post game radio show, and the two dudes were like, they were passionate. They were talking about their strength and conditioning, you know, coordinator and whatever. And they were just, they were going back and forth, and they were passionate about it. And I was like, and I just put that out. I was like, that's what we need. Like, why isn't our sports radio like this? Instead, we have two guys that try to troll our own fan base, and it just drives me crazy. Well. Again, I feel your pain completely because if you say good things about Louis- the University of Louisville here in- on sports radio in this town, you're called a homer, which, uh, right. hello, people. We are doing a show that supports our team. We're not going to sit here and be like, oh, we're going to get blown out every week. And we're not – it's it's just – it's the same thing. We've got. To, I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to start no radio beef here in the city. But we've got a. We got a couple of hosts that just love when ne- they're Louisville fans and just love when negative Louisville stuff comes out. Uh, so they can. So they've got stuff to talk about, and they just. We've got a couple of former basketball players here in the city that ever they can't wait for Chris Mack to get in trouble, so they can go on their shows and say, "Hey." Denny Crum was better. Like, we know Denny Crum was really good, but what's that got to do? Rick Patino, this. Rick's not here no more. Like, it. Uh, yeah. okay, so that's why I asked you those first two questions because, uh, or that first question, not two questions, the first question because I knew we were going to relate on that because I feel your pain. Our listeners feel your pain. And anytime you need somebody to, to do anything with you on the radio, if you ain't got nobody – if Will's busy, call me up because, man, I love sports and there's nothing I like more than talking crap about the Blue Bloods in the state. I love it. I appreciate that. Not a problem. So I've asked this question on every edition of Game Day Prep, and I know it's been a while since we joined the ACC, but uh, what, I, what I was curious to find out is what are your overall feelings so far on Louisville to the ACC? Other than the hookers, obviously. I, I know where you probably stand on that. <laughs> 
I, I like Louisville in the conference. I think they're they're a good addition. I I'm not sure. They get a lot of, and this has always been my personal philosophy. I think they get a lot of credit for what they did in the Big East, and that has not yet translated as much in the ACC, which, yeah. you know, to, to be expected is a better conference. I right. have more problems with us adding Syracuse and BC and Pitt as I do Louisville. I think Louisville is kind of a the right fit for what this conference tries to do, and you know, I think your fans are very much our kind of fans. I think your you know, your programs are all very much our kind of programs. So I like Louisville. I like Louisville in the conference. I want Louisville to be better because I think the conference needs a team that has the brand that Louisville does to help lift the overall conference. Right. Right now we're relying on Clemson only because Florida State's bad, Miami's bad, Virginia Tech's bad. Right. We don't have any other real programs that have a good enough name that can help the conference, you know, lift up its credibility. So I like Louisville in the conference. I think Louisville has not reached its potential in this conference, uh, but I think they do fit much better than some of the other schools we've batted. Especially Maryland. Gosh, that's a dumpster fire. I'm glad that we didn't have to right. coexist yeah, was, with. Uh, I would but, trade Louisville for Maryland 10 out of 10 times. My brother's going to appreciate He's got this little thing he does every podcast where at the end of the show he's like, don't forget Maryland's trash. I don't know what Maryland ever did to him, but he's pretty adamant about his hate for Maryland. Uh, but I, I will agree with you to an extent. I think that Louisville has not uh, reached their full potential in the in in men's basketball and football. I don't think basketball is too far off of, of doing that. I think football is taken obviously when when you lose Charlie Strong and then you've got to go through a couple years of Bobby Petrino 2.0 and then now you've got Coach Scott Satterfield. Uh, that's going to take a little while to to because that's been yeah. the whole duration of the ACC. It's been Petrino and Satterfield, but as far as the other sports, women's basketball, baseball, volleyball, all, all the soccer. I mean, Louisville's a top twenty team in all those other sports. So I would say I'm not really sure. Just being completely transparent with you, I'm not really sure how the other schools are as far as sports team as a whole. But I think that Louisville, Louisville's portfolio, their resume. It's pretty impressive when you – I mean, field. I can't believe I forgot Coach Sowery and the field hockey team. I mean, th they've only lost two yeah. games this year, and it was the number two Iowa and then number two Michigan. So, I agree with you. I think that the two main – the not I did not say main, so th please nobody crucify <laughs> me out there. The two sport – the the two big men's sports, basketball – men's basketball is right on the cusp. Football, yeah. we need a jolt. We need – and – I think we're going to go on a run. I, I had predicted. I don't want to – you know what? Let's save that for a little bit. But I, I feel like we're about to go on a little bit of a run here. I do – okay, let's get to that in a minute. But anyway, so <laughs> the third question. The Cardinals are 7-3 and three versus NC State, and they are 4-2 and two in the ACC era, including a bowl game loss to you all. We weren't in the ACC yet. That was the next season, but – uh, no, no, it wasn't the next season, sorry. But that was the day our website launched. Cardinalsportzone.com launched the morning of the NC State Louisville football game. Our first piece was on NC State. Uh, so, and then you all rewarded us with uh, one of the three losses that we've incurred to you all. So we do appreciate that a lot. But <laughs> what what is the Louisville NC State rivalry meant to you? And what is like a favorite moment that you have of it, from it? Well, when I was talking about Louisville programs, I just meant the football program. I think. Oh, okay, really okay, that's good. fair. That's yeah. fair. Basketball, baseball—they've all been good. Women's basketball, et cetera. The rivalry, I think it's awesome. I, I, I enjoy it. I think State needs a another rival that is very similar to what they are. Right. I think we had that with Clemson for a while. Technology or engineering school, you know, for perennial eight win team. You know, right. I think there was a lot of. We had a lot, a lot of that there, but they've they've gone and elevated. So now we're with Carolina, who's really only cares about basketball, and they like to talk down to us. Wake Forest, who really nobody really cares about, except for once every five, six years for whatever reason, like this year. <laughs> and I think Louisville and NC State are very similar, right? And I came up to Louisville in 2018, I guess it was. Man, it's been three years already. And it, it was the end of the Petrino area. It wasn't a very good time for y'all. Nope. But your fans were awesome. The tailgating scene was very much like ours. And I just think there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of similarities there and a lot of good, you know, the, the relationship is strong because I think those two, the two schools are very similar in what they're trying to do. They're trying to, like you said, you know, get out from under the thumb and under the shadow of their neighborhood blue bullets. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what you guys are trying to do. I think there's a lot we can play in there. So I, I enjoy it. I think the games are always good. Uh, they're always interesting. And I, I just, it's a good addition for me. It's a good addition to the conference. I will say for me, it, it's been my favorite rivalry so far, even though there's like the, and I don't, it's only like a, a, a six game sample size here. So it's not like we've completely dominated you all, but even the, the one year Louisville uh, Lamar was at the helm. I think it might've been his Heisman year and we were up like 45 to nothing at the half. And then you all gave yeah. us a game in the second half. I mean, it didn't get super close, but it was still just like, and I think a lot, we've talked about it though. The fan bases are similar. We're both we both kinda were blue collar towns. We we were both like underneath the thumbs of the idiotic blue blood programs that are in our state. I mean, North Carolina, they don't even go to class. I mean they make up their own classes and, and we have to deal with I mean, the Kentucky fans, they will they'll they will sit here and it don't matter. I could sit here and post on Facebook, had a great day. Got got a uh, got a mile in on, on the uh, on the pavement, at trying to rehab the injury, which I haven't tried to rehab it yet. But I could do that, and they'd be like, "I got a mile point one, go cats!" <laughs> and it's like I could literally tweet out going to take a crap, and they'd be like, "I took two, go cats!" Like, shut up. But I think there's a lot of similar, like you said, there's a lot of not only in our teams but in in the fan base. One of my favorite right I mean my fa- not one of my favorite rival in the baseball and ACC baseball is NC State because we we bring it to each other every year and it that's just fun and I know we're talking about football now but it, it's still it is probably I would have said Miami but they don't ever beat us since uh, they haven't beaten us a lot since we got in the ACC we got more wins than they do so that's not really a rivalry but that's just a Miami dig I just Shout out to all my Miami followers there. But, no, I, I like the <laughs> NC State rivalry. I think, it, it, like you said, they're similar programs. You've got similar coaching philosophies. And uh, even when you look at the stats of the teams, they're both pretty pretty similar, pretty balanced. Uh, let's go lighthearted for a second. I wanted to ask, And I've asked everybody this, and I've had to change the question up as well. Favorite Louisville player of all time, and you cannot pick Lamar, and you cannot pick Teddy, because people started picking Teddy when I said you couldn't pick Lamar. So now I'm taking Teddy off the table too. Oh, hmm. I, I mean, there's there's they have some names going back in the day, and I forgot who the little running back was that we played in. One of the bowl games was the year we had Mike Glennon. Was it Brandon Radcliffe? Oh, guys, I don't think so. I don't remember who it was. That guy was. I really liked watching him. I thought he was. Um, he was dynamic enough, and, and I really, actually, to be honest, liked watching Tutu Atwell last year. Tutu, uh, yeah, he was that, something different for sure. Was, yeah, he's a guy that can you know change a game, and he just did. He just did things like everybody knew they were going to throw it to him. And they couldn't stop him. And I, I like watching those kind of guys, man. That that was the one thing that was so transparent last year. We we were, and again, I I don't dislike Scott Satterfield at all. I really don't. I think that he's not had enough time to really prove himself here yet, especially with the COVID year last year. So I don't have anything negative to say about him. But he runs that very basic uh, run on first, run on second, throw on third, run on first. It just it's just so repetitive and it's 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 a rushing dominated offense. And here at Louisville we're just used to throwing the ball and, and seeing the scoreboard light up. But uh yeah. you, you knew on third down we were throwing it to two two. There was no uh there was <laughs> right? Yeah. Like there was only one you could tell that in practice they're like, all right, we're gonna run we're we're writing this play up and uh your your one read is two two. Your your second read is uh, two two. Your third read is um. Oh yeah, two two. So it, it just didn't matter. It was like well, it, they were. Th- and I think that's what Malik threw fourteen interceptions last year. He's cut down on that a lot this season. He had only thrown two going into the game against Boston College. Threw two and neg- I think the I don't want. I don't like making excuses for people, but he has 
uh, cut his bad decisions down, his bad decision making down a whole lot. It, there was rain in play. I think that had, I, I will say the one was his fault, but the other one, it had to do with the ball being wet. But uh, yeah, he it just, it was throw to two, two, throw to two, two, and oh, by the way, throw to two, two. So yeah, that's a good one. Nobody has said two, two yet. Uh, you're going to have to, after the show, you're going to have to let me know who it was you were talking about, the running back, because I'm thinking during that bowl game, Brandon Radcliffe was our running back. It could have been Bilal Powell. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it was Powell. Um, I completely forgot he was. Um, yeah, I think it might not have been the bowl game that I was thinking of, but I think it was Bilal Powell. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll check that out. I mean, you'll have to – I can look it up too and I'll throw you some names or whatever. But anyway, last question before we get to the – get to the – you know, the meat of the program, you know, the serious stuff. For the Cards fans that are on their way right now to Raleigh, wh- uh, what do they need to see? Where do they need to eat? You know Cardinal fans love to eat and drink. You talked about being a part of the uh, the tailgating experience here. I'm not sure if you've ever seen the, the the little camera view over the stadium here at Cardinal Stadium before kickoff, but it's hard. When they do that, there's nobody in the stadium. And the reason why is because everybody's blacked out in the parking lot because they've either drank too much or ate too much, too many smoked meats. Uh, that's why you'll notice that as the game goes on, the stadium gets fuller. In the second quarter, you'll be like, wait a minute, there's there's 50,000 people there. There were only like 1,200 when the game kicked off. Uh, that's because people have been out tailgating. But what do people need to see? Where do they need to eat? Well, Devontae Parker was the other one I was thinking. I was trying to think who was the wide receiver. I forgot. I completely forgot about him. He's there the other one that was on my list. And then uh, <laughs> this is going way back again. And I had no idea until I was looking up names that he was even a Cardinal. Mark Clayton, when I was younger and we would throw out in the street and it was always Marino to Clayton. There you <laughs> go. Like, I didn't realize Mark Clayton was a, was a Cardinal. So Yeah, Mark Clayton I, I and Ernest. Those guys on my list. Another one that people yeah. forget about is in, in – of course, I never, I didn't see him play uh, live, but uh, Ernest Givens yeah. Yeah, was, yeah. was a card as well. But it, anyway, back on track, I always get off track here. If you've listened to any of the podcasts, <laughs> you know Jeremy gets off track. But okay, what, what do people need to go? What are some cool things they can do around town? And where are some good places they can go grab a bite to eat? Uh, you, there's not going to be many places you can go wrong. And I think what, where I would start is probably the place that would get, I don't know if it gets recommended the most, but it's the most NC centric, NC state centric place around campus, around football stadiums, the medios is an Italian place. And just going in there, there is not an inch on the wall that is not covered with some sort of state memorabilia, whether it's pictures of, you know, Philip rivers or Ted Brown, they have a, a big chunk of the old Reynolds Coliseum floor on the wall. I mean, they have all kinds of memorabilia. So if you're into sports history, it's there. They have, you know, 83 championship stuff, 74 championship stuff on the walls. I mean, they just have everything in there. And you almost always see some sort of NC State athletic alumni in there. Like, there's not a time I've been there where I haven't seen somebody like, you know, Julius Hodge or David Thompson or, you know, any of these guys that have, that they all still hover around campus at some point, somebody's going to be in there. I think that's probably the place that um, gets recommended or at least is the most NC state centric place. You know, there's a lot of new places uh, downtown that you you can't go wrong at. I mean, the, the pit is probably the most famous from a barbecue standpoint that is down there. Uh, really good barbecue and meats and, you know, whatever, all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, the Flying Saucer, it's an older place that I used to go to a lot. There's a hundred some taps on the wall. It's a real good pub. You can go in there and get you know, giant Bavarian pretzels, huge pint, and you know have a good time. But you you really can't go wrong. It's, you know you walk down Hillsborough Street towards downtown. There are just a plethora of places that uh, people can go to. Yeah, see for here, all those type places kind of closed here in Louisville during the pandemic. So you will find all that stuff at the local BW3s, unfortunately, uh, for us here <laughs> in the Ville. Uh, that, that's where we go and we see all that stuff. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, like, so you've got 
we, we talked about I'm going to go back to the previous question a little bit. You got Ernest Givens, you got Mark Clayton. A lot of people forget Deion Branch played here. Chris Redman played here. Brian yeah. Brown played here. Like a bunch of – and jo, uh, Joe Johnson, he got drafted by the Saints. I remember when I was here on my, my official visit – for, uh, at Louisville, he uh, this was like his his breakout year. He had like 14 sacks for us that year, and then got drafted. I was like, man, that's the first time I could remember somebody from Louisville getting drafted. And it was just then my teammates. Uh, I was a freshman when these guys were seniors, but Ray Buchanan, uh, Sam Madison, mm -hmm. Roman Oben, all uh, career NFL got. You know, they they played a while in the NFL each. So. I just want to make sure that I give them shout outs because when I don't give my friends shout outs, they complain and I don't want to hear. I've, I've had a rough, we talked before the show, I've had a rough 10 days. I don't want to have to deal with your whining and complaining because I didn't mention <laughs> you on the podcast. But that Julius Hodge guy, man, he's probably my favorite. If you were to ask me the same question, my favorite NC State guy ever, it would be Julius Hodge. And my favorite NC State person would probably be Jimmy V. I know he didn't really play a sport there. But uh, you know that's uh that's that when I think of NC State, he's the first guy I think of, and also, oddly enough, his brother does radio here in town in Louisville. So it's just connections everywhere, yep. everywhere you look there. But uh, really quick, since we're at halftime of the show, let's thank the fine sponsors of the Cardinal Sports Zone podcast and Game Day Prep, Fitness Market, Shack in the Back Barbecue, Four Pegs Beer Lounge, Derby City Lawn and Landscaping. An all American pool and supply. Uh, okay, let's get to talking shop now. Now, as I mentioned on the show Sunday, this game scares me a little bit. Louisville comes into the game playing better than they have been playing recently. They have actually gotten better. This is one of the few times I can remember, and I've been a Louisville football fan for probably, let's see, 30 years. I mean, if you count back, that makes me sound old when I say that. But I mean, when I was in middle school, that's when I started. The Fiesta Bowl, Louisville versus Alabama, that was a huge turning point, not only for sports in my eyes, but my Louisville fandom, because that was when I, I, I realized that, okay, we might be able to be something. We, we're normally the team that gets paid to come into town and, and you kick their butts. Now, you know, we're on the verge of turning everything around. But uh, as I said, playing better than they've been playing recently, getting better every week. But when you travel to a top 25 caliber team, and you play a night game there when they just lost the game that they shouldn't have played, uh, shouldn't have lost. Sorry, not shouldn't have played, shouldn't have lost. That is a super dangerous combo, especially when you have your all's quarterback, uh, Mr. Leary, at the helm. Oh, he's kind of like him and Malik, very similar stats, um, except for Malik's thrown four picks. He's only thrown two, but again, the the weather played a, played a part in 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 those one those two from Saturday. I digress, but. When you, when you have a kid like that at the helm, you feel a little bit more comfortable because you know, especially against this Louisville defense, uh, not so great defending the pass. I mean, they're not horrible, but the thing they do are, that we had been doing up until this past game, it took six games into the season for our defensive coordinator, coordinator to be like, maybe we shouldn't give everybody eight yards of cushion. Uh, on the wide receivers and and oddly enough we didn't give everybody eight yards of cushion Saturday and we did win that game but I again I, let's let's get back on point here what makes uh, what makes Larry so good he's in control and I, he he's he hasn't had a lot of experience one he's got a ridiculous arm talent and my man can straight sling it he's not the biggest guy but you know 60 yards in the air not a problem. He can throw, he can sling it. And he puts a lot of heat on the ball, but more so is that he makes the right decisions. He has been making the right decisions all year. He's not going to make too many stupid throws or highly contested throws. He's going to put it, he knows he's got guys that can win jump balls. It's basically what we do. And he throws it to them up there where his guys can get it. And I know that's very cliche to say, Hey, he puts it rolling. His guys can get it. But in our <laughs> case, he does. He throws it high. We have two very tall wide receivers who win those jump balls, and he throws it to them in those positions. I mean, puts them in places to be successful. And it, but I think the biggest thing is that as he's gotten more reps, as he's gotten more games under his belt, you can see him being more in control of the offense. He is willing to throw the ball away. He is willing to step up in the pocket. He he's 
he is making the right decisions. He's making the right reads, not only throwing the ball, but when not to throw the ball. And I think that's a lot of times you don't see that. I The one thing I wish is that our coaches would give him more freedom to throw it downfield. That's just not something we do a lot of or we have been. I think you're going to have to now. I think we're going to have to score more points than we have been because our defense is taking some blows on the injury front. And, and so we'll, we'll, yeah, got- we'll talk about that in a few minutes because I, I saw that news coming out earlier, and, and, and I'm with you. I'll tell you who he reminds me of, and I know earlier I said, well, you can't use either of these people, but – very Teddy Bridgewater-esque to me because Teddy, yes. he had Devontae Parker, he had Damian Copeland, he had Eli Rogers, and Andrell Smith also. Like those guys, Andrell and Devontae, very, very tall. They would catch anything anywhere on the field. Uh, Damian and Eli were the guys that Teddy could just throw the ball 67 yards down the field and through a window where only it could go like through four people and, and hit the receiver it was supposed to, and those four people would have no – chance at even getting at the ball because they didn't think the kid could throw it that far to begin with. So, yeah, he rem- he, right. he reminds me a lot of Teddy. Yeah, he does. I think he's got a better arm, bigger arm, maybe it's the right word for that, than, than Teddy does. I think he puts, he's able to put more zip on it and he can, he can really sling it. And you watch his throws uh, on Saturday and you'll see, like, there's not a lot of wavering. When he's throwing a ball, it's on a, it's on a rope. And uh, so I think that's his – that's his strength, but he's been in command of this offense, and it's, it's been good, man. It, he's – we weren't sure what to get, what we're going to get with him coming out of the injury. The pit game last year and the half of the second half of the Duke game last year, you're like, all right, man, this kid's got it. But, again, it was only a very limited sample size. He comes out early in the year and kind of looks a little sluggish and maybe, you know, trying too hard. You could tell when guys are like – you know, trying to throw the ball on target and they mm-hmm. just pull it a little bit, you know, just a little bit off. But now he's kind of settled in and you can see he's he's in command of the offense and that was, was what makes him so good. So the next question is this. So we don't pretend to know everything here like some of the other people that do media in the city. So with that being said, I am throwing a couple shots. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, for those of us <laughs> little villains that do not know, who is the NC State MVP right now if it's not Leary? Because obviously we just talked about his importance, so it would be repetitive to, to, to allow him to be the MVP as well, even though I think he probably is. But who, who would be – if he's the MVP, who would be the second guy? Or is there somebody in your mind that, that is more important to the team than Leary? That's a good question. I Offensively, I'd say Icky, our left tackle. He's going to be a top 10 draft pick. He is, he's on, un, he's unbelievably good. <laughs> he, without him, I think our offensive line sort of falls apart. He is, he's just that good. He's, he tosses guys around. He is just as reliable as you'll ever get from an offensive lineman. And it's weird to say that one single offensive lineman is your MVP, but he's clutch, man. He, he's that good. So I'd say him, you know, you could point to, Someone like Emeka Mezzi, or wide receiver, who just broke the all-time reception record for NC State. I don't know if he would be the MVP because he maybe doesn't scare teams like you would think, um, you know, of an all-time great wide receiver. He's not like a, a Tutu Outwell, right, who's going to scare you, he's going to burn you deep, but he's just reliable. He makes great catches. Uh, Thayer Thomas would be the other one. He just, especially the last three or four weeks, he has just been making – making plays but if i had to hold me to fire i'm gonna say icky i think he's our best player uh, even without leary Icky's our best player on offense i think he reminds me i don't know how much you watched of louisville or how much you've watched the pro- professional but makai becton is who i would relate him yeah. to louisville wise makai just man the first day i saw as a freshman the first day i saw him in practice i was like this kid is going to be special and if it wasn't for him lamar don't win that heisman because you, right. you say it with it just being one person, the the whole line falling apart, how odd that is to say, but I can completely relate because I feel like without Makai, the other guys are solid, but I think Makai brought that leadership to the team and uh, really helped hold that together, and it prevented Lamar. I mean, Lamar did not get injured here at Louisville at all, but speaking of, of, of injuries as we transition here, perfect transition, the injury bug has bitten you all. 
this season, most significantly on the defensive side of the ball. How how will not having Isaiah Moore be on Saturday night, especially when Malik is best when he's running the ball kind of to that side of the field or, or his strength is throwing short passes right to the middle of the field where you would expect a linebacker to be defending? What, what kind of um, – I guess what I'm asking is, how is that going to be without him? Do you all have somebody to step up and kind of like – Obviously, not be as good as him, but but tell the tell the the card tell Cardination what what to expect as far as that's concerned. I don't know what to expect. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, I'm gonna be honest. We lose our ACC preseason player of the year, defensive player of the year, Peyton Wilson. We lose the midseason defensive player of the year, and Isaiah Moore. We've lost uh, our starting safety. We have lost the NFL defensive tackle and CJ Clark. So it's hit us in five critical areas on defense. Yeah, I think our defense has able been able to sustain its level of play without Peyton Wilson by having Isaiah Moore. You know, it wasn't a huge drop off. You lose one, and it's hard to say. You know, losing an elite linebacker like Peyton Wilson wasn't a huge drop off, but Isaiah Moore was that good. He had still command of those linebackers. Now you're taking out Isaiah Moore. And I still think we have two very good linebackers, but you're going to add in two guys who are inexperienced. And I think Satterfield is a good enough offensive coach that he is going to probably exploit or look to exploit that. And Miami did it. End of the game last week is third and 16. Isaiah Moore goes down. We have a, a redshirt freshman linebacker, Devon Betty, in there. And they, he bites on the play action. They throw it over top, convert to third and 16, and that's ball game, right? And right. I think we will – we still have very good athletes in the, in those positions. I think Drake Thomas and Bob Jones are, are very good linebackers. Jalen Scott's getting a little bit better, but it's hard to replace an Isaiah Moore. I think Isaiah Moore was a surefire NFL pick. He is was having an unbelievable season, and – not only that on the field, but he just commands the defense. He is your captain on defense. And that really concerns me when you're playing a guy like Cunningham, who, like you said, is going to look to exploit that middle area and mm -hmm. he's going to run because Moore was just really good in contain with, especially with mobile quarterbacks. And I think that is what frightens me a lot in this upcoming game. I actually was watching the end of that game, and I was really, really hoping y'all would win that game so y'all didn't, you know, the typical lose the game that you shouldn't lose and then come in and just take it out on us. But, uh, yeah, anytime you lose two all-ACC linebackers, that cannot, that, cannot be, uh, that cannot be easy at all for you all. Uh, last question before we get to the prediction. What does NC State have to do to win this game? And then conversely, what does Louisville have to do to win this game? NC State's got to make Louisville sustain long drives. And I think that's where we saw Louisville take advantage of some teams in the past. And even some of this year is being explosive over the top. And you know, we talked earlier about 2-2 Outwell. And I, I don't know if they have – that level of dynamic game breaker this year, but they're still they still have explosive play capability, and that is what concerns what concerns me. I think our defense is good enough to force Cunningham to have to hit those big shots. I think if you just try to, you know, run uh, traditionally, as I, sh I should say, tr up the middle, you know, counters, whatever. If you just try to run basic run formations or throwing swing passes and screen passes, you'll find success early, but you're not going to find success for the rest of the game. You need to be able to hit us over the top. And I think if Louisville can do that, then they have a, a chance to win this game. I think if NC State is able to keep Louisville in front of them the whole time, I think that we have a good chance to win this game. So it's going to be a balance. It's how does Satterfield exploit the deficiencies in NC State's defense? I'm, I'm not sure how that that's going to go, but that's I think if Louisville wants to win, they got to be able to hit those big plays. I think Miami did it to us enough to keep us on our heels, and that's how they won. Yeah, and, and Louisville does to to kind of piggyback off what you said. We do have a couple of explosive playmakers. Not too, 
I don't know, man. Tyler Harrell is every bit as fast as Tutu is. We've just, for some reason, not been able to the, – the few times yeah. we, we've thrown it to him, he's made explosive plays and just ran it. Same with Amari Huggins-Bruce. He's the kid. I don't know if you saw this, but had a 94-yard touchdown. Uh, he got to about the one-yard line. He was looking back celebrating and dropped the ball, and it went out of bounds at the one-yard line. But still redeemed himself, caught his first touchdown the next week. Super fast, Jordan Watkins, super fast. But, yeah, I'm with you on this one. I feel like if you all just – this is going to sound bad, and I apologize to all of my supporters here in Louisville that are on the coaching staff but everything else. If you just keep – if if Brian Brown gives you all that cushion, you all just have to throw it all the way down the field. Don't even – our run our rush defense is, our, is, our, is where we're the strongest at defensively. Our, our safeties are really, really good. But that's not where people throw the ball. They throw it right in the middle of the field where, like, the linebackers should be, and it's just choo, 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 all the way down the field. Uh, for Louisville, I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say the key is uh, you talked about it. You didn't think that, that this would work. But what Louisville's been very successful at this year is the nickel and diamond teams, like eight yards. I mean, we're averaging, I think, we're it's like 8.2 yards per play. And it's crazy. How can you be four and three and averaging eight point two yard? Well, it's because your defensive coordinator. I don't know if you could tell I'm bothered by this or not yet, but <laughs> you, you give eight yards of cushion. I could have a hundred yards receiving at the end of the game, and I've not ran a route in twenty years. So, right. uh, but it did appear as if for anybody that saw the game Saturday, that's the best defensive showing we had all year. Forced multiple interceptions and fumbles. Uh, we instead of rushing three, we we put four or five down on the line initially. So I'm I'm really not worried about the defense. The the offense kind of had a hiccup Saturday in their uh, development and their improvement all year. But again, when it rains, I know that from from playing football myself. When it rains, all bets are off. Sometimes one of the fam- most famous games in Louisville football history is when number two Florida State came to town and and Louisville beat them in overtime and it there it was a monsoon here and that water I mean it even the playing field because you couldn't get a a grip and I know there 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 were a ton of drops and I know y'all y'all have some guys that are getting criticized right now for drops but I'll tell you this playing receiver or tight end in college football is very very stressful and even when you're really good you're going to drop some passes you get excited and look up field before you fully have the ball in your possession or your quarterback puts you in a bad position that's what I'm going with I, the only time I ever dropped the ball is when the quarterback messed up it wasn't my fault but uh <laughs> but that's 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 what I'm looking forward to it's still for me to the 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 game overall is too close to call but I'm going to say this I predict uh, a knockdown drag out game I think the score ends up being 34-31 NC State. Again, the game after a loss that shouldn't have been a loss does not bode well normally for the other team. I hope I'm wrong. I think this can go either way, but my official stance on this is we are winning this game. Uh, Who do you have? I don't know, man. You're kind of in the same boat as me. I'm like – I, I feel like I had to make a decision, but I didn't want to like be too cocky and confident. So I'm like, you know what? We're st- we still haven't put four quarters of football together yet. We've played three. Uh, our, we normally take the third quarter off for some reason. I don't know if they feel like they've got some PTO to take there, but uh, we normally take the third quarter off. That's been our biggest downfall all season. So uh, I'll, I'll let you get. So who do you have? Yeah, so you asked me earlier in the year, I would have said NC State. And all the way up through the last couple of weeks, I would have said NC State. That's I, I had us winning this game. Now NC State comes in favored six and a half. I think the Vegas line opened. I think that's probably a little too generous given where we are, you know, especially defensively. I, I think I think NC State is the better overall team. I just have some serious questions on how our coaches are going to adapt to what we've seen. Like our defense is not the same defense that was two, three weeks ago where you can count on them to pretty much stop you, right? Our defense has been really good all year. We're slowly losing key pieces. We're slowly putting in younger guys. And you saw Miami is able to exploit that. And I think Louisville has athletes on par with Miami. 
and I am concerned that they are going to be able to exploit that. Our team I is think we're st- our team is. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, our team yeah. is like a majority. The part of it is from. It's been the darndest thing even since I, even when I, I took my official visit to Louisville, like sixty five percent of the team was from Florida, and it's right. important for. I mean, you call it. You can call a spade a spade. Like having a pipeline in, in Florida is important to the overall success because those kids are just quicker. They're they're better. They're they're more knowledgeable. Overall, I'm not saying every great players from Florida, but like for the most part, they've been doing that their whole life, playing against elite athletes, and it gets them prepared. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and that that is my concern here. I think this game, I think your analysis is pretty good. I think it's going to be closer, a pretty close game. I Louisville's actually, I mean, all of Louisville games this year have been close, if I recall. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been you know, blowout, uh, typical blowout, either one way or the other. And I think this game's no different. I wouldn't take the pack and the point and give the points. Um, you know, I think it's going to be closer than I think your score 34, 31. It, it's probably pretty close to, to reality. I, I just, like you said, I, I don't know how our team is going to react from what a, a loss that they should have, they shouldn't have had in Miami. Now, this team, and I'll give Dave Doran credit, he has been pretty good in the situations they've turned around and have taken care of business. But I think Louisville's starting to play better, and this game scares me a lot more than it did a month ago. So and so you're picking so- Louisville. The, the the NC State guy's picking Louisville, and the Louisville guy's picking NC State. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be close. I, I, I know it's going to be close. I think that's – I would not take – I'll take Louisville and the points if you give me that. Okay. I'm I'm not sure who's going to win, but I'll take Louisville in six and a half all day. That's very fair. Before we wrap up the show, uh, I want to ask you a question because it's been eating at me the whole show. A couple seasons ago, y'all had a wide receiver. He may have been a tight end, but I think he was a wide receiver, and he just ate us alive. And I think he had like three or four touchdowns during the game. Do you know who I'm talking about? We had, I'm trying to think. Kelvin Harmon and Jacoby Myers. Oh, it depends on what year it was. It was just a couple seasons ago. Yeah, so 2018, uh, I think that was Jacoby Myers' game. Let me pull this up real quick. Uh, see, uh, we're gonna have a, year, we're going to have a couple of questions to answer after the show. I just I thought it might have been something that was like just uh, as soon as I said that, you were going, oh, yeah, 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 so-and-so. Because neither one of those names sound familiar to me. This was <sighs> – Carrie Angeline – who we didn't play, he didn't play, we didn't play all 2020. 2019, uh, we lost, y'all beat us 20, y'all beat us in 2019. 2018 and 2017, we won, but that 2018 team, y'all were dead in the water. <laughs> so it must have been 2017 if I have to go back, which maybe it just seemed like it was that much. Yeah. <laughs> I think Kelvin Harmon. But I think Jacoby Myers is who's the wide receiver for the Patriots right now. Has had the best okay. game against y'all. That's probably that uh, Jalen prob- Samuels might be the other guy you're thinking of. Um, I love me some Jalen Samuels. He uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh yeah. Steeler. Uh, I believe he played for he plays for the Steelers, but uh, or did. Yeah. But um, yeah. But yeah, you're right. We have played so pick six win against UCF. We just we beat Eastern Kentucky by 28. But other than that. Uh, our our win versus Boston College was 14 points, and that's not really a blowout. Um, and and you know to to my uh, you know to my credit, I can't even th- this season has just flown flown by. I, I'm missing a win in here somewhere, and it uh, EKU UCF lost to Ole Miss, just lost to Virginia and Wake Forest. Kent State, right? No, no. Just beat Boston College. Or am I saying oh, was- Boston College, EKU, UCF. Who's the fourth? Who's Jeremy forgetting? Like Wake, Virginia, BC, Florida State. Florida State. Central Florida. Florida State. Diego, Florida State. And that was yeah. a game that was closer than it should have been. And everybody's forgetting about Florida State these days. They're horrible. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's yeah. another game where we were busting their hind ends down there. And then we took the third quarter off, and they decided they were going to come back and try to beat us. I felt like we were going to lose the game. 
we didn't, thankfully. And, and kind of the same thing. It's just been, you know what, we'll talk about that at a different time. I'm frustrated. But, uh, Evan, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate you taking the time out to talk with me. Can you let everybody out there know where they can find all your work and your social uh, media handle as well, please? Yeah, anytime. I'll, I'll always come on and talk sports with you guys. Let's go. Uh, redwhitenetwork.com is the website. Red White Podcast on Twitter. It's probably where I spend too much of my time. Uh, <laughs> on this air. Yeah. And, and uh, shout out to your guy, Will. I know he does this with you. We weren't able to get him on the phone yep. today. But uh, if he's working with you, I know he's got to be a solid guy. So and so, hopefully I'll get to talk to him and meet him at some point. But, uh, I, again, I really do appreciate you taking the time out, especially here on a weekday, uh, in the middle of the day, to talk to me. So uh, much love. I do appreciate that. Let's shout out again all of our fine sponsors, Fitness Market, Shack in the Back Barbecue, Derby City Lawn and Landscaping, uh, Four Pegs Four Pegs Beer Lounge, easy for me to say, and All American Pool and Supply, and working on more as we speak. I thought I had me one last week, but uh, that kind of the week of Jeremy. I, that's all I'll say about it. I don't want to bad mouth anybody, but if you like to sponsor the Cardinal Sports Zone podcast or Game Day Prep, give us a call at five zero two six nine four zero three seven five. If or you can reach us on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, we are at Card Sport Zone. That's what we had to do. Once our other ones got hacked, we had to. I, I hate the new handles, but they're three years old now. They're still new to me. But Card Sport, one card, one sport, one zone. And uh, on Facebook, you can find us at Cardinal Sports Zone. Three words. Hit that like button. Make a Facebook official. YouTube, we're at Cardinal Sport Zone. One word. Uh, you can find the podcast on all the podcast avenues, over 117 in total. Apple, iTunes, Buzzsprout, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Google, Amazon, and iHeart. Smash that subscribe button now. If you haven't listened to all the episodes, uh, prior episodes of the Cardinal Sports Zone podcast, go to cardinalsportszone.com, hit the podcast tab, drop down menu will take you to the CSZ podcast. You'll also see CSZ on ESPN 93.9 from that iteration of the show. Before we started the podcast, we got lots of great interviews with everybody from Peyton Siva to Damian Lee. Uh, just uh, Dion Branch came on. We had just so many people. I don't want to leave anybody out. That's another thing. When I leave somebody out, oh, why did you leave me out for? I didn't mean to. I've got a lot on my mind. This is the week of Jeremy, the negative edition. Um, so forgive me if I, I left anybody out, but hit that drop down menu. Hit the podcast of your choice. Check out all of our exclusives on cardinalsportzone.com, the place that I'll begin. Shout out to everybody out there who's sharing the podcast. We appreciate you. Uh, love you guys. And uh, we want to thank you again for the support. Until next time, this has been Game Day Prep. This has been my guy Evan from the Red White Podcast. And this has been the Cardinal Sports Zone Podcast. <laughs>